Well, today I'm going to talk about uh, the effects in Indonesia of the most virulent resources boom that the world has ever seen. Uh, a boom that uh, really got underway about 2003 and reached its greatest height in 2011. It didn't proceed continuously, it was broken for a year or so uh, by the global financial crisis. So. Uh, uh, it was disrupted in uh, late 2008 through 2009, but then resumed uh, more strongly than ever. Uh, the timing of the boom meant that uh, it coincided with uh, the settling down of the Indonesian democratic political system uh, after, uh, after its uh, introduction following the uh, crisis of the late 1990s. And I think that coincidence uh, had some consequences. Uh, amongst other things, it probably made uh, economic policy to uh, support rising incomes uh, a bit easier uh, th uh, than, it, than it was going to be on a sustained basis. Uh, and so uh, uh, with the uh, withdrawal of that, that easy uh, incomes growth, uh, then uh, Indonesia, Indonesia is facing some bigger challenges in economic policy today. And I must say that uh, the challenges uh, uh, outlined by Iwan Nassis in the earlier uh, presentation um, are very much in my mind as well. Some of them uh, are connected to the end of the resources boom. Uh, some have uh, separate origins. Uh, so. Uh, uh, I'm going to discuss uh, in this lecture the, the origin of this resources boom, uh, the, the policy uh, choices made by Indonesia in the course of, of the boom, some comparisons with other countries, especially Australia, but a little bit uh, of comparison with other resource-rich countries, uh, and then the policy challenge that Indonesia faces in trying to sustain growth in incomes and output, especially equitable incomes growth, uh, now that the boom has ended. Um, Indonesia is a moderately resource-rich country. Uh, compared with some countries, its endowment of natural resources to populations not particularly rich, um, but of course it's got a much richer endowment of natural resources compared with population to than the densely populated countries of Northeast Asia and of uh, South Asia. So it's a moderately resource-rich country. Uh, in the early uh, stages of uh, Indonesia's modern economic development, uh, it was, like most countries, uh, an exporter of mainly of natural resource-based products. Uh, uh, under the, the new order, it was at first uh, petroleum and uh, later joined by uh, 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 metallic minerals and timber that, that provided the, uh, the core of export growth from the, from the mid-60s, from the uh, beginnings of the, the, the new order uh, through to the mid-80s. Uh, and that was a reasonably successful uh, period of, of development. And one thing that Indonesia did better than some countries in that period was to use uh, the incomes, the uh, uh, taxation of uh, the resource sector to support broadly uh, based development. Not perfect, of course, but, but certainly better than uh, a lot of other uh, developing countries. But, that pattern of growth could not uh, continue when the oil price fell in the middle of the, of the 80s and uh, Indonesia went through uh, a, a big and successful adjustment to more broadly based export growth that uh, anyone else has uh, introduced us to, uh, in particular strong growth in uh, exports of manufactured goods, which was very good for uh, demand for labour uh, and uh, uh, when you've got strong growth in demand for labour, it makes it easier for uh, uh, growth to be uh, supportive of broadly based uh, increase in incomes of uh, 
uh, reasonable equity in uh, income distribution. Uh, rather easier than in an economy that's relying on uh, resource exports, because if you're relying on resource exports, you need effective taxation mechanisms and then effective public expenditure mechanisms to use those rents effectively. So uh, you need a very good public sector to uh, get equity from resource-based uh, development. It happens more naturally with uh, with with, with uh, export-oriented industrialization because that fairly directly increases demand for labour, increases employment and uh, and labour incomes. Uh, the the pattern of uh, export-oriented growth ended with the financial crisis, uh, that uh, terrible set of events uh, that uh, saw Indonesian output fall by 13% in 1998, uh, a decline in output as severe uh, as uh, any European country experienced in a single year during the, the Great Depression. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, the stresses on the society from that uh, continued for a very long time and were part of the background of the transition to democracy. Um, from, uh, from the crisis uh, to about 2003, uh, you, you had the, uh, the uh, transition to, to democracy, you, you had the early democratic government struggling to find a basis for sustained uh, uh, development, uh, having the beginnings of success uh, in that, but it was a very big challenge. Uh, growth rates were much lower than, than they had been in the uh, 80s and uh, 90s before the crisis. Uh, and, and, um, um, uh, but then from 2003, uh, the opportunities for Indonesian development changed again. Uh, with the resources boom. Uh, from 2003 and 2011, you had extraordinary growth in demand for industrial raw materials of all kinds, uh, especially energy and metals. Uh, and uh, this created a new kind of opportunity uh, for, uh, for Indonesia. Uh, as has already been observed in the previous presentation, uh, this was a period in which the tendency for the for exports to diverse away from commodities, uh, diversify away from commodities, went into reverse, powerfully into reverse, and so the the, uh, the primary product share of the exports rose rather strongly uh, uh, between uh, 2003 uh, and, and the present. Uh, but then uh, the resources boom reached its peak in 2011. Um, uh, it didn't fall off a cliff immediately, but it uh, began to decline. And since then, uh, the uh, resources sector has been a headwind for Indonesian growth and development. Uh, and since then, uh, uh, it has been clear that uh, continued strong growth is going to require uh, a return to diversified exports of the kind that we had uh, from 85 until 97. Now, there was a global resources boom, um, uh, but it was really a China resources boom. Uh, this was a period from 2003 and 2000 to 2011 in which total demand for uh, resources uh, in the world economy, especially minerals and energy, uh, grew very strongly. Uh, but overwhelmingly, that growth was centered in China. And I, I'll just give, I just put up one example of China as well. This is coal consumption in China compared with other countries. The dark red. Uh, is China, the pink is uh, the rest of the world. You can see from that that the total global consumption of coal outside China was not much higher in 2012 than it had been in 1988. Uh, but total global demand increased more rapidly than it, it ever had. 
Uh, and, and this uh, strong growth in global uh, demand, mainly concentrated in China, uh, led to shortages around the world and a huge increase in the price uh, of, uh, uh, of coal. Uh, coal was probably the extreme example, uh, and a very important example for Indonesia and for Australia. Coal became, by 2011, the most important uh, export of both Indonesia and Australia. Uh, Australia had been the biggest exporter of coal in the world. Uh, Indonesia passed Australia as an exporter of uh, uh, thermal coal uh, uh, during uh, uh, this period. So both countries, Indonesia and Australia, uh, received a very strong boost to exports uh, from the growth in Chinese demand for coal. Uh, we would see a similar sort of picture for, for oil, for, uh, for copper, for nickel, for palm oil, but it's more extreme for coal uh, than for the other commodities. Um, well, to understand uh, why that happened and why the, the boom ended, you have to understand the pattern of growth in China. Uh, to produce an outcome like that, you need an extraordinary uh, uh, development. And the extraordinary development was that from the beginning of the century until 2011, Chinese economy, with more people than any other country in the world, grew more rapidly than any country ever has, averaging more than 10% per annum growth in output, which is higher. Uh, than Japan in the 1960s, which is second uh, on that uh, list of uh, uh, period, long, long periods of rapid economic growth. But not only was it a very big country growing more rapidly than any country ever had, but it was the most energy and metals intensive growth that the world has ever seen. Well, why did that happen? Uh, a little bit, it's the, the the structure of the Chinese political system and, uh, 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 and the history of development. And some of it was new developments arising out of the Asian financial crisis and later the global financial crisis. The, the historical bias towards uh, metals and energy uh, comes out of uh, the old folk, Communist Party focus on central planning and heavy industry. These were greatly favoured uh, by... Uh, uh, um, investment in heavy industry, in, in infrastructure, uh, uh, in um, uh, uh, capital intensive activities uh, was favoured by the old central planning system and uh, 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 that, that, that system was mainly a failure for development but one thing that it did do was develop a lot of skills in engineering and managing these big capital intensive uh, developments. Uh, so there's a lot of capacity uh, in China for that. The, the uh, education system was strongly biased towards edu education and engineering and science. Uh, they were, uh, the, the, the society became good at managing big capital intensive projects. They were favoured by the Communist Party. A lot of people with that sort of background ended up in senior political uh, positions. Uh, so uh, China, much more than other developing countries, was uh, inclined uh, to a development pattern that focused heavily on uh, uh, big engineering projects that in their nature use a lot of metal and uh, energy. Uh, so, uh, but uh, China was getting away from that pattern with economic reform and a greater use of markets, uh, especially through the 1990s. The 1990s was a decade of uh, very strong growth in the private sector, very strong growth of uh, uh, more labour-intensive activities, uh, 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 beginnings of growth in the services sector, getting away from that old central planning bias uh, towards infrastructure and heavy uh, industry. Um, and uh, it looked as if uh, China was going to continue uh, on that transition uh, to a more broadly based uh, um, uh, uh, industrial structure, 
uh, when it was hit by the Asian financial crisis. Now, all countries in our region, in the Western Pacific, uh, Pacific region, were uh, affected immensely by the Asian financial crisis. Uh, uh, right through Southeast Asia, most extreme in Indonesia, but right through Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, uh, Korea, uh, very severely damaged, uh, Japan, badly, badly damaged. Uh, uh, every country uh, in Southeast Asia and, uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and also Korea, Taiwan, uh, uh, Japan uh, went into recession, except uh, uh, Vietnam, but Vietnam had quite a challenge too. Uh, New Zealand went into uh, recession, Australia narrowly avoided uh, recession. And, and the Western Pacific region was a very important market for export-oriented industrialization in China. Uh, so uh, uh, China's uh, export growth, which had been very strong, went into reverse. Uh, now, every other country in the region experienced a very large fall in the value of its currency during this period. And in fact, that was part of the process where growth got going again in Indonesia, the rest of Southeast Asia, in Korea, in Japan, in Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, but China decided, uh, for a number of reasons, that it would not devalue its currency, that it would hold the parity of its currency against the United States dollar. And you know, you, you will recall how much the other currencies in the West Pacific uh, region fell. That made China temporarily less competitive. Uh, its, its exports actually fell for, for a while. Uh, this gave a very big blow to employment growth in China, and China responded to that by a massive Keynesian fiscal and monetary expansion to keep growth going. Now, it did that successfully. But the, but the way the Chinese system knew about keeping growth going in those circumstances was to push a lot of money out uh, through uh, uh, government and state-owned enterprises into infrastructure, the state, through the state banks to the state-owned enterprises, which were heavily focused on... Uh, oh, this is running ahead of itself. <laughs> <laughs> I want to stay back on China. Uh, uh, um, uh, it pushed a lot of money out through uh, the, the arms of the state, and that reinforced the old pattern of development of heavy industry, of uh, infrastructure. Uh, um, huge infrastructure projects were, were, were developed, uh, urban and uh, interurban. Uh, transport communications, uh, as well as a uh, big expansion of uh, heavy industry, uh, steel, uh, heavy engineering, of other kinds. Uh, so that's the way uh, China got growth going again. Uh, the net investment share of GDP rose to the highest level of any country ever. Uh, it was successful in keeping growth going. After a little while, export growth uh, was able to resume because growth resumed in Southeast Asia, in Korea, in Japan. But, uh, yeah, uh, but, but the changes that had occurred in China kept on going uh, for some time. And this, this uh, pattern of investment-oriented growth with very heavy demand for metals and energy, and this is part of the reflection of that, uh, I was given another big boost by the global financial crisis. The global financial crisis was a challenge for China of the same kind as the Asian financial crisis, but even more severe. Uh, when Lehman Brothers collapsed uh, uh, one uh, Sunday in September, uh, then overnight uh, the whole system of international finance fell apart. Uh, uh, overnight the orders stopped coming in for, for all those factories in uh, uh, in coastal China that were geared to supplying markets in uh, America and, uh, 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 and Europe. Overnight, uh, the, the stock started piling up in the, in the yards of all of the manufacturers. Within a few weeks, the manufacturers were in, in crisis and they, uh, they, they uh, uh, told 30 million of their workers who'd come from the countryside to go back home. They weren't needed anymore in the, the, the cities. 
And if this had continued, and of course when the crisis hit, the global financial crisis, in late 2008, no one knew how bad it was going to be. For the first four or five months, the decline in world trade was more rapid than it was in the uh, four or five months in the first couple of years uh, after the, uh, uh, the great crash on the New York Stock Exchange in, that precipitated the Great Depression in 1929. So in those circumstances, uh, China did again what it did in response to the Asian financial crisis, but on an even bigger scale. A huge fiscal expansion, a huge monetary expansion, pushing money out uh, for investment in uh, infrastructure. The infrastructure needed steel, uh, um, needed uh, electricity, uh, uh, and so you've got a ret uh, another boost to investment, to demand for uh, minerals and energy. Well, again it was successful. Uh, China had a bit of a dip in growth for uh, about a year, but then it was, uh, was growing more strongly than ever. But it was growth in this old style. Well, there were, there were many good features for China about this style of growth. Uh, uh, very good for general uh, de demand for uh, 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 labor in the economy. It, uh, it was um, uh, a pattern of growth that took uh, over a decade or so uh, uh, hundreds of millions of people from very low uh, uh, living standards to uh, living standards that, that uh, in a world scale were uh, uh, above average, uh, well above average. Um, but the, this pattern of growth had some downsides. Uh, one downside was this very capital intensive uh, pattern of growth uh, were, led to in, inequity in income distribution, uh, uh, an increase in inequality as measured by the Gini uh, coefficient, or measure, however you measured it. Uh, wages grew, but they did not grow as strongly as overall income, so the wages share fell uh, to eventually to very low levels by 2011 to uh, uh, less than 40% of uh, national income. The profit share rose. Uh, the, out of the profit uh, rising profit share, you got very high levels of uh, investment. This became a flywheel for uh, continued investment-led uh, growth. But uh, um, over time, there was increasing anxiety in the society about uh, increasing inequality in income distribution. Um, this was partly a uh, concern for distribution between labour and, uh, and, and capital. It was partly concern for rural-urban inequalities. And so the, there began to be discussion within China that that needed to change. Uh, the pattern of growth needed to change so that you would get less inequitable growth. Uh, another downside was that uh, this pattern of growth based on faster growth in demand for, for coal, for steel, for other uh, outputs of heavy industry was having a very detrimental environmental effect. Uh, it became well known uh, that uh, uh, what was happening in China was the biggest contributor to the increasing dangers of da global dangerous climate change. And lots of good uh, uh, physicists in uh, China and other climate scientists and uh, they were studying the climate change issue. They were advising the Chinese government that uh, China was vulnerable to uh, unmitigated climate change. That if, if, if this continued, if this kept going up, and then China alone, what was happening in China alone, would create a global, financial, uh, global climate uh, crisis. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, pre uh, the Premier at the time, Wen Jiabao, uh, uh, was, uh, uh, was uh, was very accessible uh, for the leading scientists of uh, China, and so so there was growing awareness in the in Chinese amongst Chinese policymakers that something had to be done about China's contribution to the global climate crisis. But uh, uh, in addition, there was a local environment problem uh, when you burn fossil fuels, especially when you burn coal, it. Uh, it leads to uh, emissions that uh, uh, have uh, health and other effects in the local environment. Uh, and China was uh, burning 
coal in particular, but also uh, oil at, at such a rate uh, that uh, the associated air pollution was uh, recognized as having significant effects on health. This gradually became a bigger and bigger issue until by about 2010 it was becoming an acute uh, issue. Uh, I remember newspaper articles uh, about uh, the low life expectancy of traffic police because they have to stand out in the uh, uh, in the pollution all the time. And then there was a very important uh, serious study of the medical effects of uh, 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 air pollution, but a joint study by the American uh, United States Academy of Science and the Chinese Academy of Science. It was directed at explaining why life expectancy was five and a half years shorter north of the Huai River than south of the Huai River, a quite distinct phenomenon. And their conclusion was that the biggest cause of this very big discrepancy in life, in life expectancy uh, was the health effects of uh, 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 air pollution in North China. Uh, well, uh, Chinese people reacted very sensitively to, uh, to being advised by uh, leading scientists that uh, if they lived in the north of China, which used uh, coal most intensively, and where coal particulates, carbon particulates in the atmosphere were much more dense, that their children were going to live five and a half years uh, uh, shorter lives than uh, people in other parts of China that were not exposed to uh, such severe air pollution. So that became a very acute issue. You might, and it's beca been becoming more acute all the time. You might have seen news of a documentary that uh, a retired um, uh, 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 employee of uh, the National uh, Television Service made uh, a private documentary. Uh, uh, about the air pollution problem, and uh, it created such a uh, such interest that it was put on the web. Uh, it was a three-hour documentary. It was put on the web uh, on uh, 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 one Friday afternoon, uh, and uh, uh, and a uh, hundred a hundred million people downloaded it over the weekend. Another 60 million unloaded it on uh, Monday morning, downloaded on Monday morning when they heard from their friends uh, uh, about it. Uh, and then the government became concerned that this might lead to a mass movement uh, of uncontrollable dimensions. So it banned the, uh, uh, the downloading after that. But probably 90% of the people in China had already watched it uh, by then. <laughs> Uh, so this increased the pressure for change in the pattern of economic growth. And, uh, uh, and, and so from uh, 2010, uh, you, uh, uh, you began to uh, see uh, uh, a movement to, towards modification of the pattern of growth. And in the five-year plan from 2011 to 2015, there was a, 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 um, a major change in the model of growth. Uh, with much more emphasis on equity and income distribution, transfers to rural areas, uh, deliberate attempts to raise uh, real wages. They were rising in the market anyway. Labour had started to become scarce from 2005. From 2005, real wages were rising much more rapidly than GDP, uh, with a, a setback during the global financial crisis. So, but then the government decided to go further than that with rising minimum wages to force an even more rapid uh, increase in, in, in wages. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a major focus uh, on improving environmental conditions. Well, well, China's a big economy. It takes a long time to move around. But you can start to see the beginnings of the change uh, in, uh, in, in policy, in the change in the model of growth, in the statistics in 2011, uh, more change in uh, uh, 2012-13, big changes in 2014. Just to illustrate with the example of thermal coal, uh, through the period of rapid growth to 2011, uh, there were, uh, demand for electricity uh, grew more rapidly than the economy. And nearly all of the growth in demand was supplied by coal. That's this, uh, th that's this story. Um, uh, with, under the new policies, uh, from 2012, the demand for electricity grew much less rapidly than uh, the economy. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, most of the growth in demand for electricity came from uh, 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 sources other than coal. Uh, um, uh, everything except coal. Most rapidly growing was uh, solar, uh, but that was from a slow, uh, a low base. Um, in qu uh, quantities, hydro contributed the, the, the most, followed by wind, followed by nuclear. All of the zero emission sources of electricity grew much more rapidly than coal. And in 2014, last year, you, you, you still had 7.4% GDP growth, but electricity uh, growth was only a few percent. Uh, and coal, thermal coal use in electricity actually <coughs> fell by about 3%, with all of the difference being made up by all of these other sources of energy, all of them growing very rapidly. Well, the similar developments in other sectors meant lower, lower demand, uh, in fact the ending of demand growth for, uh, uh, for metals of various kinds, uh, and that had a big effect uh, on uh, uh, on, on global prices. So I'll just run very quickly through the effects of the, of the boom and then the end of the boom on a number of global commodity prices. Uh, uh, palm oil, uh, to begin with, uh, and, and some of these not metals and energy, but uh, there was more than a tripling in uh, price from the beginning of the century, a peak in about 2011 and then a fall. You'll see a very similar shape of the curve in all the commodities that I'm going to put up, and that's been driven by the pattern of demand in China. Thermal coal, a bit more dramatic, um, uh, and it's come to, uh, this ends in uh, February and has kept on going down since then. Back here, uh, in June last year, uh, a, a chap working in one of the Australian investment banks and working on a big new coal project uh, stopped me in the streets of Sydney and said, uh, uh, do you know how terrible it is, Russ, the price of coal is only $76 a ton, we, and we're making all of this very big investment, uh, uh, when is it going to reverse? And I said, if you can uh, sell all of your coal forward at $76, you sell the lot, because this is the highest price you'll see in, in, in my lifetime. He was younger, so I didn't say his lifetime. <laughs> uh, uh, since then, it's fallen from $76 into the 50s. Uh, um, so so th this, of course, had a very big impact on Indonesia and, uh, and Australia. But, but just running quickly through the others, similar profile, not so extreme for oil, uh, but, uh, and the, the fall off uh, started later, but uh, has continued. Um, uh, LNG, similar, uh, nickel, uh, similar profile, different because it never again regained uh, after the financial crisis, the peak that it uh, reached before the global financial crisis. Copper more like, uh, like energy. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, 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 very, uh, a similar story across all commodities. And, that had a big impact. Well, uh, uh, Indonesian uh, production of some commodities responded very strongly to that price incentive. Uh, the most dramatic response was in coal, uh, and uh, uh, production uh, uh, kept on going up. And you'll see that some of the most rapid production growth was after 2011. Uh, when the demand stopped growing, supply kept increasing. And that's a general pattern all over the world. In fact, the moderation of growth in supply from Indonesia is uh, much faster than in Australia, where there's been a, a continued growth in supply capacity. That's partly because uh, a higher proportion of Indonesian production was from smallholder activity, which can be quickly reversed, uh, whereas the big capital intensive projects uh, uh, they, they just keep on going, and uh, it takes years to, uh, to stop the momentum for that. So, uh, uh, but uh, this is a general uh, global picture that uh, uh, supply began to increase rapidly after Chinese demand stopped growing, and so that is going to lead to a huge global oversupply, and low prices are going to continue to get lower. Uh, for some time until there's a rebalancing uh, uh, of supply and demand.
Uh, just, but the story in Indonesia, uh, well, similar, uh, very strong growth, not as strong as in coal, but quite strong in palm oil. But for most other uh, products and all of the other mineral and energy, uh, China did, um, Indonesia didn't have uh, a growth in uh, 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 production. Natural gas uh, uh, is no, no higher now than at the beginning uh, of the boom. Uh, oil has actually fallen. Uh, why did that happen for gas and oil? I, I doubt very much it's that Indonesia doesn't have the resources uh, uh, to explain why uh, Indonesia didn't get a supply response when the rest of the world did. Uh, I think you have to uh, uh, um, uh, understand a lot of the barriers to investment in, uh, especially in uh, natural gas production that held back investment in Indonesia at a time when there was a huge expansion of supply uh, in most other uh, gas producing countries. Um, uh, uh, nickel did have some response, uh, but, but then that disappeared in, in uh, 2014. The, the peak in 2013 is a bit artificial because there was a, an acceleration of exports to try in advance of the ban uh, on uh, exports of unprocessed nickel. Something uh, similar for copper. Uh, 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 so uh, it's really uh, only in coal and some of the agricultural products, especially palm oil, that you had a very big supply response. Uh, but Although uh, volumes uh, did not increase, volumes of exports uh, for many of the other commodities, the total value, including the real value of exports, did rise a lot because prices rose so much. For most commodities, uh, from 2003 to 2011, uh, prices increased by four or five or six times, so that even if there was no increase in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, volume, you've got a big increase in value of, of uh, exports. Well, um, what were some of the macroeconomic impacts of this boom? Well, uh, the, the total effect of on the terms of trade of Indonesia was very large, uh, averaging out over all commodities and remembering that the manufacturers didn't have any increase in price at all, and, and they still remain significant in uh, exports, although a declining share. Uh, Indonesian terms of trade increased by 74% uh, uh, from 2002 until a couple of years ago. Um, uh, and uh, 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 this uh, this chart taken from the World Bank just focuses on the, uh, uh, the recent development since the end of the boom. Um, just a macroeconomic impact. Private consumption in Indonesia has remained pretty steady, pretty, pretty strong, but uh, uh, total investment, this is not just resources investment, total investment in the economy has been falling uh, since uh, the beginning of 2012, and that's very significantly the result of declining investment in the resources sector. Uh, and net exports uh, has been actually falling uh, in this period. And, uh, Again, you get an, artifi an artificial peak in uh, 2013 as mining companies pushed as much uh, uh, unprocessed uh, nickel and copper and other raw materials out the door as they could before the ban uh, came in. So, so that's a very heavy headwind to growth, what's happened to investment, uh, total business investment, what's happened to uh, net exports. Um, uh, now, the, the boom... Uh, very substantially increased uh, government revenue. Uh, uh, Indonesia do, does not have very effective mechanisms for taxing the greatly increased incomes uh, of the and profits of the uh, resources sector. That's a weakness of public finance in Indonesia. But nevertheless, uh, with the systems that exist, uh, there was a, quite a substantial increase in, in revenue, especially up to 2008. A dip uh, uh, after that, and uh, um, in the, and uh, that, that that strong growth in uh, revenue from 2003 onwards is significantly influenced by uh, uh, the, the resources boom. And quite apart from the direct taxation of the resource sector, uh, investment and increased activity in the resource industries gives rise to general growth in incomes. Uh, higher government revenue. Mostly the Indonesian government uh, spent that as it received it. There was a, 
a, a, a slight reduction in uh, in deficits uh, uh, for uh, uh, for for a part of the, the the period. But over the period as a whole, of the resource boom as a whole, uh, most of the increased revenue was spent. Uh, we'll see that that was a very similar pattern to Australia. Uh, uh, another effect was uh, a big uh, appreciation of the real exchange rate. If I'd gone back to the beginning of boom, this is taken from the World Bank, it only starts from 2005. If you go back a couple of years, you start from a much lower point. Uh, uh, fluctuations in the uh, real effective exchange rate, but a general uh, uh, quite strong upward tendency. Big dip in uh, 2013. Uh, uh, partly in response to lower commodity prices, partly in response to the tightening of uh, monetary policy in the United States. But uh, uh, but that a substantial part of that has been reversed since. The different measures of the real effective exchange rate, I'll come back to another one. Uh, the real value of uh, Indonesian ex uh, uh, goods exports uh, increased extraordinarily uh, up till 2011. Uh, that's a big flywheel for growth in the economy. This is the, the value in U.S. exports uh, uh, deflated by uh, a U.S. dollar price index. Uh, so that's the sense in which I use real, real. Uh, it's an increase in the real purchasing power of exports. Well, that's uh, increased uh, uh, almost five times uh, over a decade. Well, that's a huge impetus to growth. But that's gone into reverse uh, since... 2011, and so it's headwind to growth uh, since 2011. Um, now, uh, uh, what, one feature of Indonesian development uh, with which you're all familiar uh, is the presence of, uh, uh, of subsidies for energy, uh, and the, the period of rising prices, rising world prices uh, for uh, oil made it difficult to uh, uh, keep uh, subsidies under control under the old system of uh, uh, fixed domestic prices. Uh, 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 so that uh, through this period, from time to time, uh, about a fifth of the budget was being spent on energy subsidies. Uh, uh, the, the recent uh, uh, changes of policy since the, the change of government uh, uh, will, will dramatically reduce that uh, uh, one would hope on a continuing basis. Um, uh, one, one consequence of uh, uh, the, uh, one, one characteristic of the Indonesian uh, resources boom has been greatly increased uh, production of coal. A lot of facilities were developed for export, uh, but then were used for domestic use as well. Uh, and so uh, we're beginning to get a chart for uh, coal use in Indonesia that looks a bit like a small-scale version, but not so small, of the old Chinese uh, uh, chart, uh, with uh, ver very strong growth in, um, uh, uh, in electricity uh, uh, use in Indonesia uh, through the period of the resources boom, but almost all of the growth coming from combustion of coal. Uh, and this is not trivial in total amount. Uh, from uh, 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 about 120 million tonnes a year, thermal coal uh, uh, emissions from thermal coal. Uh, uh, um, uh, well, so this is a forward-looking chart from PLN uh, that anticipates a growth from 120 million tonnes to 280 million. So if we get a continuation in future of what's been going on in the Chinese electricity sector, uh, then growth in Chinese uh, carbon dioxide emissions from uh, uh, just from thermal energy alone uh, will be responsible probably for uh, most of the world's growth uh, in carbon emissions from uh, 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 from thermal coal combustion. Uh, well, putting uh, the Indonesian macro story in an international perspective, I've just got a few comparisons. Uh, with uh, other resource exporting countries. Um, I don't have Indonesia on this chart because I, uh, in preparing the chart, I wasn't satisfied I, I had good data actually on Indonesian net government debt. So in a published version of this paper, Indonesia will be there. Uh, but uh, uh, here's a list of other uh, resource exporting countries subject to much the same influences, uh, some of them more powerfully than uh, 
uh, uh, than Indonesia during the resources boom. Um, you'll, you'll notice that uh, uh, Australia, like like Indonesia, had a moderate reduction in government debts, despite the fact that it had an immoderate increase in government revenue in the uh, early years of the resources boom. Uh, we, we had a uh, we, we got rid of our small uh, uh, government debt and had a, a small surplus, mainly saved in uh, a fund to uh, to pay future liabilities for public servants' uh, superannuation. Uh, so there was a small uh, budget consolidation in Australia, but tiny compared with the increase in revenue. So that actually is a s similar story to Indonesia's, if uh, when I get the Indonesian data there. Uh, but Australia had a big discretionary fiscal expansion during the global crisis and has not pulled back effectively from that. So uh, net debt of government has continued to uh, 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 to, to increase since then. Uh, that Australian story can be contrasted with Norway, which had high marginal taxation on its, the increased value of the oil exports, uh, and then saved uh, most of the increased revenue in a uh, sovereign wealth fund. Uh, and so uh, uh, that debt of, uh, uh, of Norway, Norway's on the right-hand side, it's a completely different scale to the others. Uh, but. Uh, uh, Norway developed a, a, a large government financial assets during the boom by, by taxing most of the increase in the revenue and then putting that revenue into a, a public uh, wealth fund for use after the boom. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the current account <coughs> deficit reflects what's happening in net exports, but uh, uh, as moderated by changes in domestic savings. And uh, a country like Norway that manages to put most of its uh, increased uh, resource <coughs> income into a sovereign wealth fund uh, won't have, will find it has uh, uh, an, uh, a, a, a lift in its current account surplus uh, times of rising export prices and the reverse in times of falling export prices. Uh, well, this this set of countries uh, uh, mostly had deteriorating uh, 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 current account deficits at the time of very high export prices. So that indicates that they were spending the increased revenue plus a bit more. And Indonesia is one of those countries. Uh, and we can con can contrast uh, Indonesia. Uh, 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 with uh, two countries that adopted a different approach, uh, Chile and Norway, uh, which uh, uh, put a tax and uh, kept in a separate sovereign wealth fund most of the increase in uh, uh, resource revenue. Uh, so uh, they did not have the pro-cyclical movement in the current account that uh, Indonesia had. Uh, um, one consequence of spending the uh, increased resource revenues as it, rise, as it arises is that you introduce pressure to increase the real exchange rate and that makes you much less competitive in everything other than resources. Uh, and uh, uh, by this measure, uh, which uh, from the EIU uh, database, uh, Indonesia had a larger appreciation of the real effective exchange rate than than other countries. Um, and again, you can contrast uh, the situation of these countries, of Indonesia, South Africa, Brazil, and Australia, which didn't take strong measures to, to save the increased revenue from the resources boom uh, for use after the boom. You can contrast that with two countries that adopted a different approach, Chile and Norway, uh, which both uh, uh, had mechanisms for uh, for taxing a very high proportion of the increased revenue and then saving that in a sovereign wealth fund. Uh, so um, that different approach to stabilization of the economy under the influence of the resources boom meant that, that uh, Chile and Norway did not have a big increase in the real exchange rate. Now a consequence of the increase in the real exchange rate is you make everything else less competitive. Uh, in Australia's case, we. Uh, from the uh, the bottom of the boom in 2003 until the peak, uh, the real effective exchange rate rose about 70%. Well, that 
that sent into reverse what had been very strong growth in exports uh, of manufactures and services in the previous two decades. And Australia uh, uh, found itself very much more dependent on resource exports, an actual decline in many services and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, manufactured exports. Much the same happened in Indonesia. Uh, uh, this is the Indonesian story. And the, the disturbing part of the Indonesian story, and this is mostly the result of the appreciation of the real effect of exchange rate, is that uh, since the end of the boom, uh, 2012, 2013, we've had uh, exports falling not only for uh, uh, resources, but for manufacturers and uh, uh, agricultural commodities as well. Uh, and, uh, and that's a, a, an indication uh, of the extent of the adjustment problem that Indonesia fa faces uh, at the end of the resources boom. Well, this is a big challenge for Indonesia. If it's going to get growth going, uh, or maintain growth at the end of the resources boom, it needs to make the sort of adjustments that were made successfully in the middle of the 1980s. It needs a big, real effective depreciation of the exchange rate, a fall in the nominal exchange rate, without the uh, price effects of that being inflect, in, uh, reflected in increasing price levels generally. Uh, to, to get that exchange rate effect, you'll need relatively tight budgets with, with um, uh, less tight monetary policy. You need a mix of fiscal and monetary policies that focuses the tightness on fiscal policy and not on monetary policy. Uh, that's what gives you uh, an exchange rate depreciation. Uh, you need um, policy reform to restore growth in productivity, and uh, when I just introduced the nature of the problem, the whole world has had a problem of lower productivity growth uh, since the financial crisis. It seems that Indonesia has as well, uh, and, uh, uh, it, it, and policy reform is going to be necessary to change that. The resources boom has been one of the causes of decline in productivity growth. Um, the resources boom encouraged a lot of interventions in the resources sector that are unfavourable to productivity growth, including the, uh, uh, the bans on unprocessed uh, exports of, uh, uh, of minerals, including some of the restrictions on uh, uh, direct foreign investment. Uh, that, uh, those interventions are damaging to productivity in the resources sector, but uh, uh, there are much more widespread interventions that need to be reversed. Uh, how much of a real effective exchange rate depreciation is required? I think that at least Indonesia will go back, need to go back to the pre-2005 situation. So we're talking about an effective, a large effective depreciation. Um, and, that, uh, and that's going to require a strong focus on, uh, on reform in the period ahead. Um, uh, in uh, all of the... Uh, there's a, so uh, summing up the, uh, uh, the challenge facing Indonesia in the context of what's happened in the last decade, uh, one can sum up around the question, uh, was the resources boom good for uh, development in Indonesia or bad for it? Was, was, it a, uh, was the resources boom a curse or a blessing? There's a large economic literature that suggests that the resource boom is often a curse. Uh, it's associated with um, uh, an increase in rent-seeking behavior in the political economy, more influence of vested interests on the policy process, partly because resources are allocated by the government to uh, particular interests, and so that focuses uh, uh, political pressure backed by money on uh, 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 on receiving benefits uh, from government. Uh, uh, Paul Collier's book on the bottom billion, which focuses mainly on African uh, uh, conditions, uh, concludes that generally resource-oriented growth is associated with higher levels of corruption, uh, poorer governance, than uh, other patterns of, of development. We can see some signs of weakness of this kind in the recent experience of Indonesia and also uh, of Australia. Uh, and uh, this is a problem 
uh, for uh, the reform that's needed to maintain growth after the resources boom. You need, you're going to need a period of strong policy in the public interest where government is strong enough to resist pressure uh, from vested interests uh, uh, in both Australia and Indonesia. I, I don't think that that's going to be successful without uh, two important developments. One is the strengthening of the independent centre of the, of the polity, the, the public discussion in the public interest that uh, Professor Sudley uh, made such a large contribution to uh, in Indonesia. Uh, unless you have that strong public discussion, then government will not be able to resist the pressures uh, 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 of vested interests to stand in the way uh, of reform. Uh, and uh, uh, in addition to the strengthening of the independent centre of the public, policy discussion, I, I think that both Australia and Indonesia are going to need uh, uh, to reform uh, of financing of uh, political campaigns and political parties uh, because it's difficult to see how uh, a government's going to be strong enough uh, to uh, implement hard reform policies in the public interest if it's uh, subject to pressures of the kind that have accumulated in both of our countries in the last decade. Uh, from uh, uh, wealthy vested interests. Thank you.